Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. The, before I start the sermon, as it were, I'd like to read you a poem. It's a true story. It happened 200 years ago here in England. The evangelist was a man called Roland Hill. He was, pre he was put out of the churches because of the way he preached. He preached in the highways and the byways, in the fields and in the city streets. And this is one of the stories that took place when he was preaching. Will you listen, friend, for a moment? While a story I unfold, a marvellous tale of a wondrous sail of a noble lady of old. How hand in heart at an auction mark, soul and body she was sold. Twas on the broad king's highway near a century ago that a preacher stood, though of noble blood, telling the fallen and low of a saviour's love and a home above and a peace that they all might know. All crowded around to listen and wept at the wondrous love that could wash their sins and receive them in his spotless mansions above. While slow through the crowd a lady ploughed in her girded chariot drove. Make way, cried the hasty outrider. You're closing the king's highway and my lady is late and her majesty's wait. Make way, good people, I pray. The preacher heard, his soul was stirred, and he cried to the rider, Nay! His eyes like lightning flashing, his voice like a trumpet sound. Your grand fake days and your fashions and ways are all but perishing things. Tis the king's high way, but I hold it today in the name of the king of kings. Then, bending his gaze on the lady and marking her soft eye fall, and now in his name I say what I proclaim and bids for this fair lady call. Who will purchase a whole, her body and soul, coronet, jewels and all? I see already three bidders. The world steps up as the first. I will give her my treasures and all the pleasures with which my buttery thirst. She shall dance each day with joy and, uh, and gay with a quiet grave at the worst. But out speak the devil boldly. The kingdoms of earth are mine. Fair lady, thy name with an envied fame on their brightest tablet shall shine. Only give me thy soul, and I give thee the whole, their glory and wealth to be done. And pray. What hast thou to offer, thou man of sorrows unknown? And he gently said, My blood I have shed to purchase her for my own, Amen. to conquer the grave and her soul to save. I tread the wine press alone. I will give her a cross of suffering, a cup of sorrow. To share, but with endless love in my home above, mm. all will be righted there. She shall walk in light, in robes of white, and a radiant crown shall wear. Mm. 
Thou hast heard the terms, fair lady, that each has offered for thee. Which wilt thou choose? And which wilt thou lose? This life, or the life to be. The table was mine, but the choice is yet thine. Sweet lady, which of the three? She took from her hands the jewels, the coronet from her brow. Lord Jesus, she said, as she bowed her sweet head, the highest brother art thou. Thou gavest for my sake thy life, and I take thy offer, and take it now. I know the world and its pleasures, at best the weary and cloy, and the tempter is bold, but his honours and gold prove ever a fatal decay. I long for thy rest, thy bid is the best, Lord, I accept it with joy. Amen, said the noble preacher. And the people wept aloud. Years have rolled on, and they all have gone, that formed the awe-stricken crowd. Lady and throng have been swept along, like a crowd in the, uh, in the morning sky. But the mightier, but the saviour, has claimed his purchase and around his radiant seat a mightier throng with a joyful song. Amen. The wondrous story repeat and a form more fair is bending there laying her crown at his feet. Shall we pray? God and Father, we ask thee that even in this simple poem, people will here will understand and know that there is a Saviour above who has paid a great price for them. And that there is, in fact, a home in heaven for everyone if they only accept him. We pray for a blessing on the company, a blessing on the preacher as well. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My dear friends, I do thank you all for coming this morning. Though my subject, the Lord has put in my heart, is mainly for Christians. Now you might say, that's me. But is it? What makes a true Christian? Well, a true Christian is one who, with all their heart, accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. And is born again into God's family. If you're not saved, born again, then I pray that before the service is over, you will have become a true Christian. Now to those of you who are born again, I know without a doubt that you are on your way to heaven. You have started a new life. And the Lord Jesus says, show the world that what took place in your heart is real. How do you show that you are earnest? The first thing I would say to a new Christian is to read the word of God. This is the first thing. Get to know what the, the, our God has to say to you. 
To a new Christian, I would say, start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Get to know Jesus. He has died for you. You've accepted him, but get to know him better. Read the word. Then I would say to you, get to a place like this. A church. When Marita and I came to England, we looked everywhere for a church that we could say, this is where we want to put down our roots. It was only uh, in February we came here for the first time and we joy enjoyed it. We realized here were people that know the word. Mm. And that is why we said, this is where we want to put down our roots. Mm. But you might find somewhere else. The main thing is, read the word and find a group of Christians who are a fellowship to you, a family to you, that will help you on your way. That is how it starts. But there's something else. We must obey the Lord in baptism. I want to turn to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verse 18. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Ghost. Here is a command from the Lord. He is saying to his disciples, teach the people, tell them about me. And when they have got saved, when they have trusted in me, then baptize them in my name. In the name of the Father. That is what I would call the next step. You go down into the water. You are buried under the water. You rise from the water. It's a symbol of the Lord's burial, death, burial, and resurrection. It's a symbol of that. And we are following the Lord in that sim simple way of being going down into the water and being baptized. And if you're saved and born again and you're not baptized, then you're still a child of God. And God still loves you. And you are on your way to heaven. But if you're not baptized and you are a believer, you're a disobedient child of God. That's something to think about. A disobedient child of God. A child of God just the same. But a disobedient child of God. That's right. So, okay. I'm saved. I'm born again. I've obeyed the Lord in baptism. What now? Now I'm sure you are like me. You have relatives and friends who are not saved. When I say relatives and friends, I'm not just talking about a good friend that I have. I'm talking about the next door neighbor. I'm talking about the person I meet in the street. Here in this church where they go into Peterborough, to the square in Peterborough, and they tell others. They're friends, to, and they tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. You must tell them. They must be saved.
Why? The reason is that they're going to hell. Mm -hmm. My dear friend, can you think about it? Mm -hmm. Think about it earnestly. My relatives and my friends, they're going to hell. And I know that, and I can tell them why, what to do. I can tell them they must accept the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Am I doing that? Am I telling others about the Lord? Am I say, am I giving them the opportunity That's right. to trust in the Lord and be saved from hell itself? You and, must, you and I must tell them the danger that they're in. And it is our responsibility. The Lord says, go and tell others. And though I'm saying this, it might be too late already. It might be too late already. Let us read 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. First Corinthians 15 and verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be all changed. In a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Mm. Have you got it? In the twinkling of an eye? My dear friend, I am going to be with my Lord and it could be now. Right now. Before the service is finished, all those who are here who are true Christians, born again, saved, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, will be gone from here in the twinkling of an eye. And it could happen right now. Amen. And that, my friend, is so important to us who are Christians. We're longing for that day. What a wonderful day that will be. Amen. I long for it. But what about you? Will it be, oh friend, that you are left behind? It may be that you are the one that's still sitting in this seat here in this church and everybody else is left. Think about it. I'm going to see my Saviour face to face. Mm. Oh the joy, oh the singing, oh the worship. As we stand before the Lord, can you think about it? Can you hear it? Can you see it? It will bring, it brings even now tears of sheer delight to my eyes as I think about it. But there is more, much, much more. Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse 10, only one verse. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in the body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. We must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not unsafe people that stands here. That's right. And I, Christians, saved, born again believers, we must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The wonderful thing about it is that no sin will be brought up. Why did I say that? Sin was dealt with at Calvary's cross. Sin was dealt with then. Martin Luther had a dream and Satan came to him with a large list of his sins. And Martin Luther said to the Satan, is this them all? And Satan says, no, they're much, much more. And when Martin Luther read them all, he said, yes, I am guilty. Then he said to Satan, now right across them, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. Amen. That is a wonderful thing. I'm so happy. My sins will never be brought up at the judgment seat of Christ because Christ has dealt with them already. Amen. Amen. I used to sing in the Sunday school this little song. Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free and in my heart's a song Buried in the deepest sea Yes, that's good enough for me I shall reign eternally Praise God! My sins are gone, 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 gone We used to sing that in Sunday school and it's so true mm. My sins are gone wiped away. So what does take place at the judgment seat? Last Sunday, our brother's not here this morning, but last Sunday our brother that was speaking, he, he spoke about concerning the, uh, the attitude of the work of the Christians. Our attitude. We do, it, do we do it lovingly or do we do it grudgingly? Mm. The, I've heard it, I've even heard it. Oh, I suppose I better do it. There's nobody else going to do it, so I better do it. Then we have the ones that says, Oh, look at me. I'm doing the work of the Lord. Isn't it wonderful what I'm doing? The attitude of people who work for the Lord, Christians. And what do we find there? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians again. Chapter 3 this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse 11. For other foundations can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the, for the day shall declare it. 
because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what it, sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet by fire. Do you see? If we build to the glory of God on the foundation of Jesus Christ, then the Lord sees it as gold, silver, and precious stones. But if it is to our own glory, then it will be burned as hay, wood, and stubble. We're still saved. We're still going to heaven. But we have lost the reward that we could have had if we had been doing it to God's glory rather than our own. We will lose a reward. Well, let us turn our thoughts on those who are building on God's foundation. To me, one of those gold nuggets is a Sunday school teacher and the wonderful responsibility they have. But that through that door there, what about this door here? That's the kitchen in there. Yes, the Lord sees and rewards the tea makers. You might think it's nothing much you're doing. You're just making the tea for everybody here. But the Lord's watching and paying attention. And the Lord will reward even the tea maker. There's a story told of about a preacher. He was going to be preaching in a certain church. And he uh, had never been to this church before. So he was preaching in the Sunday morning, so before that, on the Friday, he thought, I'll go and see what it's like inside this church that I'm going to be preaching in. So he went to the church. The church was open and he went in. And he heard the noise coming from one of the pews, but there was nobody there. He couldn't see anything. He went down, and there was an old woman scrubbing the floors. And as she was scrubbing, she was speaking. He could hear her speaking all the time. The old lady realized somebody was listening and looked up. The preacher said to her, I'm sorry, but I could hear you speaking. What, are you, what is it? Oh, she says, as I scrub the floor between the pews, I know where most people sit. I know the names of the ones that sit in that seat and sit in this seat. So as I'm scrubbing, I pray for them. Mm. Each one in the church was being prayed by this old scrubbing woman. Mm. Yeah. What a reward she'll get in heaven. Only the Lord knew what that old lady was doing. Now let us look at the rewards. The scripture tells us that there's five crowns that the Lord will give on that day. Let us look at the first one in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 24. Now ye know not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize so run that ye may obtain and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown but we an incorruptible mm. here we have the athletics crown. In Paul's day, 
the winner received a laurel wreath, which through time faded away. Today, men and women already, even now, started to train and sacrifice for the Olympics in four years' time. They have a, a decision which race they will run. Won't be the 100, the 200, or the 300 meters. Their trainer will advise them because they are desperate to win the gold or silver or bronze medal. What about you and I? We are in a race. We are running for Christ. It may be that the Lord has got a special duty for you. It may be a missionary. It may be giving out tracts. It may be to bring up your family. That is a job for the Lord gives to you each one. A job that he gives us as we run the race. Basically, we run whatever race God has set for us. And we must do the very best we can. Remember, it's for our Lord. And he will award us with the incorruptible crown. Amen. Turn now with me to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians and chapter 2. And it's one verse again in verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Here we have the soul winner's crown. My dear Christian friend, you might never know until you stand at the judgment seat of Christ how many people have come to the Lord because you put a track through a letterbox. <clears throat> you think it's just an ordinary thing to do. I think a Christian does. But you do it, I hope, prayerfully. And only the Lord knows the increase it gives. That's right. Tracks have been given out in many different forms. There was a company in Liverpool used to seal small bottles with a track inside it. And I was given a number of these tracks and what you did was when you were on a boat, you threw them over. You never knew where the wind and the waves would take that bottle. But that bottle would one day come ashore somewhere and somebody would open it. Only the Lord knew where that track was going to land. And so there's different ways of bringing people to the Lord. And it's our duty to do it. The soul winner's duty to bring others to the Lord. And do you know something? Even if we don't know that person has come to the Lord. It says in Luke chapter 15. It says there was joy in the presence of the angels of God. Over one sinner that repented. Isn't that wonderful? Mm, Isn't it great? On that day you will receive a crown of rejoicing. I have no words to describe the joy in our hearts when that will be. Mm. Now let us turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
and verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance. This is the watcher's crown. This is what was speaking. I was speaking about earlier, about the Lord coming and looking out for him. Here is the watcher's crown. He could still come before the service is over, you know. Amen. And look out for that. Be, be prepared. I know that this is a crown that my mother would receive. She longed for the Lord coming. She didn't look for death. She longed for him coming. And she brought me up in that sphere of knowing the Lord was coming. You know, there's a, a funny little story. I was only very young. But I, I remember, this is how eager my mother was of teaching us that the Lord was coming. And I remember saying, will I be able to take my Bible with me? I was very young, and she said, no, you don't need your Bible. The Lord will be there. You'll be speaking to him. You see, she brought me up so eager to know that the, the Lord was coming. Mm -hmm. So she would receive a crown when the Lord, when she went at the judgment seat of, her, of Christ. A crown of righteousness. Let's turn now to 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. And verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The shepherd's crown. Is this the crown that only pastors and preachers and those that teach the word receive? No. There is the Sunday school teachers that we've said before. There's the mothers and fathers who bring their children up and teach them the stories from the Bible. All will receive a crown of glory for feeding the flock. Crown number five is in James. James chapter one. James chapter one and verse twelve. Blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. This is the martyr's crown. We are privileged to live in a country that as yet does not persecute us for our faith. But it could come. Mm. And the Lord will reward the Christians that stand firm. Mm. When I was young, I keep mentioning my mother, but never mind. <laughs> When I was young, my mother would tell me stories of the Covenanters. They were Christians in Scotland who stood for the Lord against the king and the soldiers. The last two martyrs in Scotland were two ladies, Margaret McLaughlin, she was aged 63, and Margaret Wilson was a young girl of 18. They had been to covenants. They disagreed with what the king had said. The king said, one, that the church in Scotland had their bishops over it. And they disagreed with that. But that wasn't as important. There was other things. There was one thing, the mass had to be said in all the churches. And they believed that was a blasphemous thing. Mm. Number two, and this was the main one, they had to uh, 
say an oath that put the king of Great Britain head of the church and they said no only the Lord Jesus Christ can be head of the church and that was the main object of the, the covenanters to bring in to go against the king and have the Lord Jesus as its head. These two women were tried at the courts and found guilty. And they had to be, uh, die by drowning. The Solway Firth between Scotland and England is a very high tidal part. And so the old lady was tied to a stake near the water's edge. The young girl was tied to a stake near the land, but where the tide would cover her. As the tide came in, it covered the old lady, and at the, as it came to her mouth, and that, you could see she was struggling, as the water was getting to her mouth and nose. The soldiers went out to the young one and said, See, look what's happened to the old lady. She's struggling. The girl says, No, I don't see her struggling. I see the Lord with her. The Lord Jesus is struggling with her. Then she started to sing. This 18-year-old girl started to sing the 25th Psalm. Uh, you should read it one day. It's a wonderful psalm, the 25th psalm. And she sang it because in those days in Scotland, and even yet in some of the churches in Scotland, only the psalms are sung, no hymns, just the psalms. And so she sang the 25th psalm. And then she read Romans 8, a wonderful uh, chapter. But the main thing was her singing. As the water covered their head, they actually went out and pulled the stake up and pulled her out of the water and relieved her and said, accept the king, pray for the king. And when she came, to, she said, of course I pray for the king. I pray the king will be saved one day. I pray for his salvation. They said, then you will uh, take the oath. Oh no, she said. He's not the head of the church. And they pushed the stick back into the water and she was drowned. They were the last two martyrs in Scotland who stood firm for the Lord. This could still take place in this country today. We have to be know where we stand if we stand firm for the Lord Jesus Christ. The martyr's crown. Let us read Romans, eight, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Fear now. I should say fear none. <laughs> fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. A crown of life. We have looked at five crowns that the Lord will give to the faithful. The athletic's crown, a crown that's incorruptible. The soul winner's crown, a crown of rejoicing. Watcher's crown, a crown of righteousness. The shepherd's crown, crown of glory, the martyr's crown, a crown of life, 
Now, when I started this morning, I read that poem. And I just want to read you the last verse of it again. But the Saviour has claimed his purchase. And around his radiant seat, a mightier throng in a joyful song. The wondrous story repeat. And a far more bare affair is bending there, laying her crown at his feet. Let us look at Rome, uh, Revelation chapter 4. And Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, first of all, verse 4 says, And around about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they were on their, and on their heads crowns of gold. Now down to verse 10. The four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before him before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Amen. My dear friend, although the, the, our dear Saviour gives us rewards and gives us these crowns of glory what a wonderful thing it will be for us to kneel down at his feet and put our crowns to him he's the one that is more honourable to receive the crowns than we are and what a wonderful way of worshipping him by Casting our crowns at his feet. Mm. I just want to say one other thing before I finish. People often say to us, we ha don't have a picture. We don't know what the Lord Jesus Christ looks like. Well, there is three pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ in Scripture. The first one I want to read is a picture that the unsaved see when they look at the Lord Jesus. It's found in Isaiah 53. I'm reading one verse in Isaiah 52 first. It's verse 14. As many as were astonished at thee... His visage was so marred more than any man's, and his form more than the sons of men. Then verse 1 of chapter 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he has grown up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form or comeless. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. That's how an unsaved man sees the Lord Jesus. No beauty that they could desire him. One day, I'm afraid, they'll see him as it is spoken about in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 13. And this is what it says there in chapter, Revelation chapter 1 verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. 
and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in its strength. My dear friend, if you are still unsaved, if you still haven't accepted the Lord as Savior, that is how you will see the Lord in a day to come, with a sharp two-edged sword coming from his mouth. But what about you and I who have trusted the Lord? How do we see Jesus? The Bible tells us that we as a group of Christians, as a church, you see, this building is called the Calvary Baptist Church. But really, it's not the building that's the church. It's the people in the building that makes the church. And we are the church. And as a church, we are the bride of Christ. That's what it said. We are the bride of Christ. And how does the bride see her the bridegroom? And we find that in... Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter 5 and verse 9. And this is what it says in Song of Solomon 5 and 9. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou uh, dost so charge us? My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousand. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven's. His eyes are the eyes of doves by the river of water, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies dripping uh, sweet-smelling mirth. His hands are as gold rings set with the barrel. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphire. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedar. His mouth is most sweet. He is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. And this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. May it be, O my dear friend, that he is your friend and your beloved. Amen. Amen. Amen.